All right, welcome back everybody to um, the uh, Back to the Sal um, study course um, that, uh, that we've been doing these last 20 something uh, weeks. Um, the purpose of these sessions, broadly speaking, is to walk through um, our principal, Emma's principal uh, source for our curriculum, the, the, the Getty, our, for the recruit cur curriculum anyway. Uh, to walk through it and to um, not only get a chance to actually read the manuscript, um, but also take a look at some of the things which might um, pass us by if our um, regular activity is just coming to class at the cell. Because there is something of a distance between what's on the page in the book and what you end up experiencing on the cell floor. That stuff is often... Um, packaged and articulated to you in, in various and sundry ways um, for the purposes of teaching and um, it's not necessarily exactly what's on the page as it were or not obviously so um, we're taking this opportunity to um, read through through the getty and uh yeah and uh I'll, I'll learn a lot about it ask some questions get to know it a little better and so on in preparation for our return to our collective cells in 2021 um, I have been principally leading this uh, a session as an Emma Free Scholar. Kel has also um, been here in recent weeks. So you are getting our view uh, often of um, what things mean, what things are, etc. Um, but it's important to note that things aren't the case just because we say they are. We want to convince you um, that the evidence in, in question uh, says what we say it says. Right. We want to convince you. We want the evidence that convinces us to convince you as well, because this is, of course, a scholarly enterprise our school is involved in. Um, so with that um, note, as always, if you have questions or comments, please do speak up. There's no dumb question or um, chances are if you have a question, uh, half the people in the room at least have it as well. So um, please do speak up if you have them. Um, and um, yeah, let's let's have some fun. So today we are in the the plays of the axe, I believe. So um, last week um, we finished the posters of the axe, and again, broadly speaking, we've entered the second half of the book now. So the first half of the book comprising, broadly speaking, the sections of grappling, or abrazare, dagger, and sword in one hand and in two, with some transitionary sections here: bastonocello, cello, dagger, and sword this mixed weapon section, and of course the Senyo page, smack in the middle. And then we have in the second half of the book, sword and armor, axe and armor, spear and armor, and then mounted combat, both on horseback and on foot. So um, we're in this second half of the book. Not only has these uh, have these sessions built on each other, but the, the book also builds on each other. So for any of you who might be listening to the um, these YouTube uh, or th these sessions on YouTube and who haven't necessarily walked with us from the beginning to now, um, I do think it's important to note, especially if you ever you ever watching these these videos and you feel like you're lacking some context, it's important to note that everything compounds upon itself in Fury. So. Um, if you feel like you're lacking context when you're watching these, um, it may be because you've watched them out of order, or uh, as it were. And I say that because um, it's important to note that not only is the armored section of the book, right, the second half of the book, relatively inaccessible to the modern person, because we just don't have any experience in armor whatsoever, it's a completely foreign thing to us, um, so it's it's inaccessible in that sense, but it's it it's also it also builds on and rests on everything that comes before. So if you don't have a good grasp of everything that came before, when you look at the armored section, you're going to be you're going to be double confounded. Confounded first by your relative inexperience with armor, the context of armor, and then second with your um um. Uh, lack of experience with the first half of the book. So all that is to say is that it's important that students remember when we're looking at the armored section in Fiore that it builds on everything that came before. And it's not necessarily possible to take it 
uh, in its own as its own separate thing. In fact, many, I'm including Kellen myself, <laughs> would advise directly against that. It's not its own separate thing. It's the culmination of the art uh, as we've seen it so far in the book. So, with all that said, let's get into it. So, axe and armor, this is where we're at, um, which the section starts at folio 35 VA in the Getty. And the plays begin at 35, uh, 36 VA. So just to summarize what we saw last time, we saw a bunch of um, posta, six posta, which incidentally two um, are unique to the Getty, these last two. Um, and I know we're not really going out of our way to make comparisons with the other versions of Fury that we know. Um, that would slow us down too much for our purposes. But it's interesting that uh, these two um, plays are unique to the Getty and the PD and the Paris, uh, which are the only other two versions of Fiori that have the Polax section, uh, they only have these first four. So that's that's interesting. But so anyway, last week we looked at these six posta, posta breve, serpentina, the short serpent, true cross, posta di donna, and middle uh, iron gate, or boar's tooth, depending on what uh, how you read it. Um, these posts in and of themselves we're already familiar with, of course, but here we are seeing them with the axe. And then lastly, we have uh, tail on the right and uh, finestra on the left with the axe. And so today we're actually going to get into the plays, which is awesome. And it's going to be tons of fun because these plays are bonkers. Um, they're very brutal <laughs> and they only get better as the section goes on. <laughs> So maybe we'll hopefully we'll end with the <laughs> we'll end with these and we'll have a great laugh uh, by the end of the, of the class. All right. Um, does anybody have any questions um, or uh, comments that they want to make before we start? Anything lingering from last week? No. Okay. All right. So let's uh, let's just launch right into it. So the first play here is um, 36 VA, and notably it's not a master play, or at least rather it doesn't have a crown and it's not called a master in the text, but I suppose we'll see that in a short second. Uh, Alex, would you like to read the text for us? Please and thank you. These are the plays through which these guards fight. Each guard wants to try them in the centrality of winning. If you can beat the opponent's axe, the ground is shown. By all means, do these plays. Do all the plays as long as the opponent does not stop you with a counter. Thank you very much, Alex. Okay. So here's the first play of the axe in armor. So let's unpack this a bit just so that we can try and understand it. These are the plays through which these guards fight. I take this first sentence to refer broadly to all these plays. Okay. Then it's not referring to, per se, this play in particular or just the ones that follow. And this is important to note because as we're used to, we're used to this organizational system in Fiore where he starts, typically, he'll start a, a series of plays with a master. And then the scholars, right, the guys with the golden uh, garter, they are the students of the master and they will follow on from the play of the master and we've, we saw this very consistently in dagger right so the scholars are, are following from whatever the master did there is no master in the polack section so that makes it a little more difficult at first for us to figure out what the hell's going on okay um so in this first play is a scholar right is this the first scholar of this of the section so he says, these are the plays through which these guards fight, that being the whole, all these plays in this section. Each guard wants to try them certain, uh, a certain to win. So each guard wants to try each of these plays in this section in the certainty of winning. Translation, all of these plays can be done from all the guards that we saw, right? And you should do them with confidence, right? I'm going to act them... You know, going to act with confidence in the certainty that all these plays can be done from the the guards that we just saw okay um now now we're getting to the subject of the 
of the actual play here. Oh, we can hear you, Kel. Uh, Kel, can you hear us? Uh, okay, he can't. Uh, we, we can hear you, Kel. Uh, okay, yeah. So now we're getting to the uh, actual subject of this play here, 36 VA. Now he says, if you can beat the opponent's axe to the ground, as shown, by all means, do it. And do the other plays as well, as long as the opponent does not counter you. Well, this last line kind of, is kind of stupid. Thanks, Fury. <laughs> thanks. No thanks. All right. Yeah, do the plays unless you're countered. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, specifically about this play here, 36 VA, what is he saying? He says, if you can do this, do it. All right. So what does that mean? What we have here is we have the scholar who has um, beaten the opponent's axe to the ground and is overbound. OK, now we've looked at this subject a couple times so far. Um, we, we looked at the concept of being overbound versus underbound, specifically in the breaking of point with the sword in two hands. But the broad takeaway for our, for our purposes is that being underbound is bad. You don't want to be underbound um, with your weapon. You don't want to be the guy whose weapon is underneath the other person's. And the principal reason for this is that when you're underneath, your weapon cannot come in between the weapon that's above you and your body. Right? And on the in the reverse, being overbound is great because your weapon now has a straight path. Uh, we can still hear you, Kel. Um, maybe he can hear us. Um, your weapon has a straight path to the to the enemy without their weapon being in the way. In fact, you're suppressing their weapon. So being overbound is great. Being underbound is not so great. So the first lesson we see in the Polax here is that um, in this Largo play that we know, right, to re reflect on what we talked about last week, Polax is interesting and different from the sword in two hands in armor in that the sword and armor tends to go to stretto based on its nature the sword and armor tends to be in stretto M most of the plays that we saw in the sword and armor were stretto plays and that's for a reason um, the armor is relative proof against the sword in largo um, long thrusts notwithstanding of course um, so this this makes sense. That's the sword and armor tends toward um, uh, strato to a certain degree. The axe, however, can effectively defeat armor at Largo. So there is very much a robust a robust Largo play as well as strato play in the axe. And the first play here we see is that a great thing to do in this Largo play in the axe is to overbind the enemy. And if you overbind the enemy you're going to get opportunities to do two things. And these are the two scholars that follow. So while it's the case that the first scholar, well, this first play isn't a master, um, both of these plays here can follow from an overbound position, an overbound position. So that's interesting, all right? So these first three plays kind of come together a bit. But regardless, this first play here, Broadly speaking, and very simply, it's overbind the the enemy, overbind their axe. Um, any questions about that? Does that all make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, great. Let's um, let's move on. When Kel's actually able to uh, fix, sort out his I'm, technology. I'm, I'm oh, here, I'm here now. Oh, hey, there you go. I was just gonna say. Yeah. Uh, uh, I had to restart my machine. Okay. Anyway, uh, it's, um, uh, you want to add anything? Uh, and, uh, yeah, I would. Mm -hmm. um, Aaron Beatty sent me a list of questions uh, more than a week ago, and we got through about half of them on Scholar Night. Uh, in this particular case, he made a comment about the uh, breaking axes to the overbind to the ground uh, reminds him very much of breaking sword, yep. breaking point. And, well, yeah, it is. Although it can be against any blow um, and not just a thrust, it is effectively the same action. You right. are creating an overbind. So, uh, Aaron, if you're here tonight, good question. Yeah. All done. 
Yep, it is very much in that in that same vein. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Actually, yes. that just came to my mind. Mm -hmm. um, so we can do some plays that have come before the Polax section with Polaxes, right? That's established as part of Fury. Um, can you do the first play of Longsword with ah. Polax, or is that just dangerous and stupid? Because you just nail each other in the <laughs> end. That's a great question. Oh, no, it's a, it's a great question. I don't think it would work. You're wrong. Uh, oh, yeah? It would Sorry. work? Yeah. Um, I taught this in a class for... For some reason, Dave Savette uh, decided that I was going to instruct the class that he was supposed to instruct at... Uh, one of the Lansing events, and it was Lance and Polax uh, from Fiori. And basically what I started off with was showing them the sword, uh, first play of longsword, and, and a lot of the people that were German tradition just couldn't wrap their heads around it because they're so eager to make a bind. Uh, and once I started showing them, it's like it goes right through your head. And then I handed them a Polax. All of them figured it out right away, like immediately. Mm. They figured it out because the Polax mm. has a lot more inertia. So when you start swinging a poleaxe, if you make an, um, uh, oh, what's that? sorry, if you Pendente? make a, an, uh, it, no, oblique, sorry, I'm, I, I was stuck in obscure, but that's the wrong word, uh, you know, I'm getting old. Um, if you make an oblique cover the same way that you do with the sword, in this particular case, you get exactly the same result. You cool. aim for their right eye and you end up hitting them dead center in the face because of the deflection of their pole axe to the outside however it is enormously risky because if you screw it up ah. you're either going to get punished in the hands arms or face mm. but if you do it correctly and your pole axe isn't a tinker toy made out of a closed uh, closet uh, piece of cedar then you will be able to enact this action without any trouble whatsoever and you'll hit them in the face every single time play over. Your other option is if they're swinging this at you and you don't think you're going to make the cover, you think you're a little bit behind, then you go plow through it and go to breaking point here, you know, like uh, breaking point. Get it down to the ground and then you can work on other things because it's no longer a serious threat to you unless, of course, they know the next dance. Um, this play is the first play of longsword out of armor uh it can actually work with swords in armor if you have someone foolish enough to take a fendente at your head and you happen to be foolish enough to be standing in a, an out of armor guard you can still make the play work it's just that well you're going to annoy each other by one of you being hit in the face and the other not it's just not an effective uh, attack against someone that has a closed visor if they have an open visor like the Chalata on the scholar here, well, there's a good chance of it. The, uh, the Zubidori that's attacking him has a, a full armet with uh, a visor, but he's got the visor raised for visibility reasons and breathing reasons. Because with Polax, eh, you know, there, there are a lot of people who don't like to play with Polax. Brian's got high, uh, Brian McElmo's got a little problem with his vision at distance. He's more nearsighted. Polax is not something he likes because he just can't see it well enough. And, uh, well, it's it's always been one of my favorite weapons for 40-some years, so I don't have any issues with it. And all of these things can be done, but to make that play, you cannot have a wide grip on the axe. So in many cases where you want to catch the uh, incoming blow between your hands, literally using your either of your thumbs as a, a center gun sight type of thing, um, you can't do it that way. You have to use the length of the axe to, to bear, bear it down. And it's much more challenging with the sword because of uh, all the inertia involved. So whoever asked that question, excellent question, and you're right on the beam. Right, there you go, Graham. Uh, so it apparently can be done with uh, a number of provisos, <laughs> important provisos. <clears throat> uh, all right, any, anything else? Yeah, I, I had a question. Please. When we were comparing it to uh, the the longsword play um, with a poleaxe, would you step on it the same way you do with the sword or not? Hmm. I don't know if it would be different with a longer weapon. Hmm. Well, uh, you may find that out soon. You may find yes. that out. 
in a couple of plays. And, 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 hmm. and yes, and when we get to that play, there's a very, <laughs> very important thing you must know. <laughs> good, can, good question. That's Amber, right? Yep. Yeah, that's Amber. Th thinking ahead, okay. Amber, anticipating the book. That is excellent. Uh, you're on it. We'll that's see good. that shortly. Yeah. See that shortly. Oh, bye. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, without further ado. 36 VB. Absolutely. My absolute favorite play in Polax. I think it's the most wonderful thing, and you will not find this play in any other manuscript that involves armored combat, That's cool regardless one. of the tradition. Uh, it's not it's not easy to do, but if you played pool or billiards, you get the idea of how to handle the half of it. And actually, if you played with lance, which is uh, a simpler but yet more complex weapon to use, because it's it's got very limited actions so you have to have much mastery of it compared to the Polacks. Um, this particular play is so much fun. Mm -hmm. John Woods tried to do this to me in a tournament. <laughs> it was such a pain in the butt because I've done it to so many other people. But John Woods in the tournament in 2008 kept trying to do this in a lance fight and I finally I finally shoved his elbow out of the way and like stabbed him in the back but it was an ongoing thing and the crowd was howling because it was really funny a lot of people didn't get what was going on but the people that did realize that John was blinding me constantly and I kept shrugging his arm off and trying to attack him and then he'd just shift the attack and blind me again it was absolutely wonderful it's in one of the uh, one of the YouTube videos of the tournament from 2008, John Woods oh, yeah. versus me. You really, if you want to see this play in action, I mean, the leg part didn't happen, but the, the visor business, it's amazing and so fun. Really cool. All right, so let's uh, read the text for this one. Um, Andrew, would you like to read the text for us, sir? Okay. Here is a student who thrusts his axe between the opponent's legs while covering his visor with his left hand. When the opponent can no longer see and tries to turn, he will fall down for sure. Thank you very much, Andrew. All right. So this is a neat one, um, and it's uh, it kind of covers a lot of topics. So um, it's it's a, it's a really neat one to, to talk about. So first of all, what is this play? It's kind of obvious. The scholar on the right has put his axe through the legs of the uh, of the opponent and covered their um, ocularia so that they cannot see and inevitably when they move or when they're shoved or whatever uh, they are likely to trip and that fall is going to be a doozy um, but that's really not all what's going on here what's going on here is um, a, a bunch of things first of all getting the axe between the legs right it's important to remember in armor that your your vision especially with your visors closed uh, is is very reduced right uh, what's a good percentage I don't even know 10 percent 15 percent there 15. you go so significantly reduced and it's um, mostly uh, what vision you have is mostly limited to the upper body area you don't really have good vision low right at all now occasionally people's visors have uh, strategically placed uh, holes in them that you can actually look down and see your feet um, that's less common than 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 common um, at the waist and below uh, you don't really have a lot of uh, a vision so once okay. the uh, I'm well, gonna interrupt you there mm -hmm. in in the case of any sort of uh, pointed visor Mm -hmm. Almost all of them have what you would call like a grinning mouth or a pouting mouth or whatever. And that slot along the bottom gives you a really clear view from the hip down. Uh, and that's how you control your reins on the horse, for example. So all of the visors of the mid to late, well, I'm going to say that the, the third, the fourth quarter uh, of the 14th century have those uh, holes near the bottom of them whether the visor is very pointed or not it's only the mid-century visors that are more like round or what people call shovel face or whatever. I mean, even the the so-called 
you know, shovel face or uh, there's a plow, uh, is, is the way a lot of people describe it in English these days. Uh, even that visor has a significant set of holes near the bottom of the uh, the movable visor. And if it's a great helm, like a helm as opposed to a helmet, uh, there are a number of holes around the bottom which are typically crosses. And what those crosses are for is to mount chains into, so retention chains so you don't lose your helmet after the charge. But they also give you quite a bit of vision and breath. Uh, so to say that you can't see anything down below means that you just haven't spent enough time in that particular helmet. And if your helmet is made in such a way that you have no vision below, you really need to go back to your armor and give them a smack. And well, say, so, here, try this again. To be clear, I didn't say that you often couldn't see below. What I said was the vision was often poor, or that, at least that's what I was trying to get at. And it is he, very and, poor. And even if you have those, the, those, uh, uh, those holes for vision, you're still only at 15% of your total vision. So, um, okay, L let me qualify a couple of these things. Mm -hmm. The 15% vision is from our calculations based on our um, minimums for standard uh, visor openings for our helmets, for mm -hmm. our practice. A lot of uh, helmets have a little bit wider, a lot more visibility because they, they were like a a long thing, and in some cases they were a little more open, like a sure. like a helm visor is, mm -hmm. is more open. Mm -hmm. um, but by the uh, the same token, an awful awful a lot of people just said and put their visors up, so that really wasn't an issue. So it was enough of an issue to not uh, tolerate the loss of uh, breath and vision, to tolerate the chance of giving getting a pole axe or a lance or something in the face. The people were willing to risk it because they felt confident enough in their skills. Um, that's a very telling example of these people knew what they were doing. They weren't just sure. like, yeah, well, nobody's going to touch me because I I go to church and have mass every morning. You know, no, 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 no. Like, fighting is fighting. Um, so when you, when you look at these kind of things, their vision might be as much as 20% or it might be as little as 10%, depending on the type of helmet it is. But if it's a helmet that's used for uh, melee combat, like, like, open combat in the field type of thing as opposed to the joust which is a straight line run uh, they're going to have a lot more holes in the visor so you can see and 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 whatnot because also hearing is deeply impaired if you have no visors if you have no visor slots you get some uh sound in through your face oddly enough but it does happen. You know, changing visors, and I've done on many different helmets, tried on different helmets. Changing a visor from something that's really enclosed to something that's just got more holes in it allows you to hear more. And part of the hearing is because you can see what's going on. Our senses work together. Um, in this particular case, the helmets of this period, especially the Armet in Fiori's, at the end of Fiori's lifetime, the Armet rarely had a visor on it. Sometimes it would have a reinforce in the front, like a like a super gorget in the front. But uh, the idea was that they they really preferred to see and have a very close fitting helmet that it allowed them to duck things, like to to literally glance things off that a larger helmet like a bassinet with its male aventail might catch a point. Whereas with an armet, it's really hard to plant a point in an armet, really hard. And that's why. They were the in their period. They were called uh, Lelmo de Omo, the man's armor, man's helmet, and um, it was a, an innovation that uh, didn't catch on really well in other places for a long time. Anyway, sorry to, di di to digress. I just wanted to say that it's not impossible. It's just it can be harder. Anyways, the nice thing about this particular play is that it flows from having an overbound position. If you're overbound, you have the perfect entry in between his legs. If you overbind him, you have to lift your axe above his to get between his legs. Yeah, so and, it's an interesting observation. And, and so how this comes about and why the vision uh, element is important to understand is that this is not a Largo play right this oh, is no. something that you that you risk having done to you when you come into stretto with the axe um and so we have the situation where we have two people overbound here and because the situation was um 
was uh, appropriate, the overbound person has slipped his axe in between the legs of the of the opponent and gone in to obstruct their vision. Um, so when you're overbound and in somewhat close, this is something that you have on offer. And isn't that neat? All right. Um, the the second part where vision it's comes a, in, not only sorry, just to confirm. Yeah, um, sure, sure, Alex. Mm -hmm. Is when you're overbound or when you are overbounding the other? I, I'm a bit confused. To create this play, the second scholar of the, the axe master, to complete this play, you're the one that's overbound, and this is how you get out of trouble. If you so are underneath. overbound, if you are over the uh, Zugadori's axe, then you go to the next play. Yeah. So, sorry, right. Alex. This is this is a play available to a person who is underneath, not the person who is on top. So, a counter, basically, to the previous play, in a way. Uh, she, it could, you, could, you could construe previous, it as a counter. It shows a, it's a yeah. circumstance. Yeah. It's not. So, yeah. 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 That's a that's okay. a better way of putting it, Kel. A circumstance. Yeah. Rather than a play per se. Uh, here. In terms of positioning, though, can't the person that's like overbinding also do this? They'd have to no. shift themselves in a certain way, and basically, if they if they did that shift, they would um they would the other person would pop out from underneath. So you, practically, you no. In, you you yeah. feel it in the weapons. Yeah. If you try to do this play when you are on top of someone else's axe, their axe will catch your left leg as you try to step around to the left side. You're, you're like trying to get left on left. If if your uh, axe is above theirs, you can't get it in between their legs, and you can't avoid the axe head on the ground with your foot, not very easily. Whereas if you're overbound, it's a dead simple thing to do. It's it. I don't know. The only way I can describe it is for people that have played um, a ringette. If you if you're familiar with the, the variation of, of hockey that's called ringette, where it's not pucks but a ring and you put a stick down in between it, this is a ringette play to get a the, get the puck between somebody's legs, um, and you and you shoot the ring between their legs and then you step past them and catch the ring and keep going. It's kind of like a dribble in soccer, where uh, or in football where you where you you dribble around, turn the ball, get around their ankles and keep going. Um, it's a very similar sort of thing. Um, hockey players do a thing like this with the puck where they draw it towards them, uh, fake to one side or the other, and then go around the opposite side once the defense is committed. For those of you that have never played team sports, I, ap I, I apologize because I have no other way to explain this to you. But um, it's, uh, it's, it's even showing you a lot of people get very badly confused with this, but the simple matter is, is if you are overbound, you can do this play. And slipping the axe between their legs happens at the same time as you put your hand, your left hand up, and your left foot forward around their leg. It's all one movement, so there's no sort of pool cue shot and then step around all that stuff. It all happens at once. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. So does that answer your question, Alex? Yep, thank you. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Um, if you are the person overbinding, if you're on top, then you have the next play available to you. And it is exactly the same play as breaking point uh, in the sword and two-hand section without armor. It's exactly the same play. Folio 36VC. Um, BD, would you like to read this one? For us please and thank you this play can also be performed by the student before me when he is in close play as you can see place left foot on the opponent's axe while pulling yours back and thrusting into its face thank you very much bd all right so as um as as kels suggested um i would also say that this play is um, more or less identical to the um, play in the sword in two hands from the breaking a point where he steps on the blade. Yeah. yeah, and he says, and I'll cut your under your beard. It's the same play. Yeah. Now, there is one caveat. When you step on a sword, 
you don't have any little spiky lugs to step on. Uh, a Beck de Corbin, these, these pole axes have little spiky lugs on the side of them where you see kind of a square here. Uh, the part that's directly attached to the, uh, the half is often attached with some sort of a loose screw arrangement where two pyramid, pyramidical lugs are screwed through to attach this thing all together. Um, they're not they're not all forged in one piece. They got like the head is one thing, and the spear point has these long langettes forged to it or or riveted to it, and then that whole thing slips over the axe head and goes down the haft of the weapon. Generally, it is somewhat uh, uh, rebated into the wood so that it lays flush with the uh, the wood and it doesn't stick out in a rough spot type of thing. Um, they're very ergonomic tools, but that little spike is there to keep your palm of your hand off of the axe head so you can't grab it and shove it off of you if you're hooked up. Uh, and by the same token, you don't want to step on that thing because nobody has armored arches. There are straps at best, and more likely there will be laces holding your solarettes, if any, onto your feet. Uh, Leather-soled shoes, regardless of whether they're double-soled or not, the, what we call, you know, say cowboy or work boot uh, leather shoes today literally didn't exist in that period unless you could pay somebody to stand for half a day to pound the leather down to that sort of density because it's a mechanical process that was developed in the 19th century that was never, never available before. Uh, sole leather up until that point was really like half again as dense as belt leather. And today it's maybe as much as eight or nine times as dense as belt leather because of the mechanical process i.e don't want to step on a spike any more than you want to step on a roofing nail or something like that yeah don't step on a spike that's the caveat there with the uh with the axe mm -hmm. <clears throat> i really like the the scholars uh chilata here because he's got one of those little uh wolf rib uh uh, visor flips mm -hmm. it's not a full visor it just comes down and it's got basically a long nasal and a couple of ribs that go across and touch on the side of the uh, of the chilata and you know like people laugh about bar visors today in, in modern recreation combat well they're a little more elaborate but such things did exist to some extent and they're very protective I mean, if you got something like that on, unless you're facing serious thrusting activities, it'll take a glance, no problem. All right. Um, any last questions about this one? In regards to placing the foot, mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering about, like, um, would you be trying to aim further up and then slide it down like how do you make sure that you're not stepping on that because i mean it's very easy sure. to Good just question. step on any part of the long sword but this mm -hmm. is like you have to be very careful about where yeah i well, think this is just one of those things you have to not fuck up <laughs> yeah you have to you have to do uh, it know, well amber, right no no amber it so, is a very good question but the reality of it is is um if you can't dance you shouldn't fight mm -hmm. so being able to move your feet around quickly, being uh, not being stuck to the ground or very, very heavily earthy is really critical to fighting, whether you're in or out of armor. And um, uh, the, the, the nobility, the, at least the upper classes of the period were considered ignorant bumpkins if they couldn't do at least a couple of simple popular dances of the day. To go out to any sort of social function, especially family weddings, and not perform well as a dancer meant you were a bumpkin. Like like people would think of you as a clod. And that's not a good thing. You want to be looked at as someone who's agile and quick-minded and good on your feet and dressed well and good manners and all this kind of stuff. Like the things that we take for granted in daily life, for example, um, 
when I was in university uh, in Windsor, we had a lot of Chinese students come in, and these poor, you know, these poor folks had never seen, really never worked with forks and knives and whatnot, and they are used to chopsticks. So I see this kid that has never seen a donut before, get a donut in the, you know, in the cafeteria, and I'm watching him, like he's got a tea and a donut, and he's looking at the donut, and he's looking at the fork, and finally he grabs the fork, and he jabs the donut, and picks it up and starts gnawing on it. Well, to me, it was absolutely hilarious, because he didn't you know, it's not our culture. But to him, it's like, what the hell am I supposed to do with this thing? I'm not going to dirty my hands eating this. You know, it's a, it's just a different sort of thing. And you have to remember that the Middle Ages in Italy or anywhere else is not only just a different time, but a different planet, just a different culture, society altogether. So the idea that you're not nimble on your feet is going to be a big problem for you as a warrior. Yeah, and, and Amber, just to give perhaps, or to attempt perhaps a maybe more um, technical uh, answer than, than what I gave earlier, what you're doing with this foot, technically speaking, is the same thing you're doing with a hand when you put a hand on the sword, right? So whenever, you know, like if we if we remember back to, um, to here, so, uh, the Largo section, the sword in two hands, the folio 25 uh, sorry excuse me 25 vc and 25 vd you are your swords are engaged then you put your hand on the enemy's sword then you take your sword off so there's no point at all where you don't have a sense of touch on the other person's weapon and with that sense of touch you should be able to know where in time and place it is broadly speaking so the challenge in, in armor here is the same challenge per se that it is in the sword in two hands, except that often in armor, uh, your vision is much poorer. So you're going to have to really rely on uh, your, your mastery of the, your sense of touch and your accuracy to make sure you put that foot down properly. Can I expand on that a bit? Mm -hmm. Could you go back to the crossed uh, axes mm -hmm. on the ground? Oh, the axes on the ground. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. When the oxes are crossed on the ground, you have a, a sensitive, uh, you know, a feeling through the axe haft of where you are on the axe. If they're pulling head to head, then you know you've got to step ahead of your your axe. If they're if they're not, if you're just kind of you know rolling around type of thing, whatever you do, if you step ahead of your axe haft, if you put your right foot ahead of your axe haft, you will never step on the spike. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that totally makes sense. Okay, good. Cool. Yeah, I thought that would be a clearer way to explain it. Yeah, for sure. Thank you very much. All right. That's good. a good question. Um, any Anybody else with this one? No? All right. Moving on. We can always go back if you guys um, r remember a question you had about a previous play. Uh, we have we have yeah, lots of time. Yeah, no problem at all. No problem. Um, all right. Folio 36 VD in the Getty. We have this cool play here. Um, who's next on the hit list? Bruce, could you read us the text for us? Second edition. The student before me saw he couldn't thrust effectively against the opponent's face, since the latter is wearing a strong visor. So, he performs an accrescimento with his left foot removes the opponent's visor and thrusts with as much force as he can impart to his axe. This play can follow all the plays that we saw before and those that we'll see later. Thank you very much, Bruce. Good one, Bruce. Well done. Okay. So um, this is um, this is really interesting. This is another play that's, um, uh, I'd say it's on the, lo the, the long end of Stretto, but I'd say it's another one of these axe plays in, in Stretto. Uh, yeah, it's straight up because you got to grab yeah. the visor and make it work. Yeah. Um, and so um, so what he says here is very interesting. First of all, what this play is, is kind of simple in that he has lifted his visor in order to make an, uh, uh, an opportunity to stab the other guy in the face with the spike of his poleaxe. So that's, strictly speaking, what this is. That's what this is, right? Now, he gives a couple pieces of context for us. First of all, he says at the beginning, the student before me saw that he couldn't thrust effectively against the opponent's face since the latter was wearing a strong visor. 
So he passes with his left foot and removes his visor to stab him in the face. So that's really interesting, if for no other reason, that Fury is very clear here that, um, you know, <laughs> you, he's not, a, he's not a, a opposed to making your own openings, as it were, right? This isn't, this isn't friendly combat. If his visor is strong and you can't thrust him through the face, well, he's, if he's going to let you open it, he's going to let you open it, right? Uh, further revealing the dangers of um, Stretto with the axe, right? I'm not saying that as opposed to the dangers of Largo with the axe. We are, we're kind of aware that the dangers with Largo and the axe are extreme, but it's just to emphasize things that can happen to you, right? This trip that's um, sometimes difficult to see, that's bad. Having your visor lifted, that's bad too. It's in, in, the, in the sword and armor section as well. It, it works yeah. equally well with the sword and armor axe. Absolutely. It's harder, harder to do with a lance, but mm. it's, it's with the sword and axe, it's pretty easy to do. And he makes a point of saying, this play can follow all the plays before, and those we'll see after. So as a general concept, this is a thing that we can do if we have the opportunity to learn it. That's okay. what I, I read. Can I, can I give you just a little real, mm -hmm. real quick run through? Go back to the crossed axes on the ground. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the axes are crossed in the ground. The guy who is underbound decides to relieve his axe and pull back the short serpent. In the process of him retracting the short serpent, you follow him, grab his visor, and give him an eyeball jab. You know, like it flows, it flows together because the guy is retracting from a, a lowered position. He has to coil his body back to get to short serpent. So in that tempo, while he's recoiling, you Akrasari into him and lift his visor. And you have to remember that today when you see people fighting in reproduction armor, Almost everybody has some kind of a safety strap on their visor to hold it down. Never existed in period. You will never, ever find even a piece of art that has uh, a visor strap holding it down to the helmet. For the simple reason that you would die if you couldn't get your squire to undo your helmet before you choked to death or died of thirst or whatever. Um, there were an awful lot of cases where people ripped off their visors after two or three passes on the field. They came back, got their breath, got a drink of water, and literally ripped off their visors because it was causing them too much grief. And their, their uh, willingness to go into the fight and their ardor is the best word, I guess, uh, is so strong that they were willing to get in there to do their job. To do their deed, to do their job, not not really, no, not job, not really job, to do their purpose. Their purpose existed to fight. It was their place in society. You remember, there's three columns. There's three columns of society. There are those that pray, those that fight, and those that work. 99% of them were the latter. The other two were very, very small percentages, but they were very strongly proud of their position in society so these people are not your common you know you're not your common folks that go and work a nine-to-five job it didn't happen in in uh, in the low countries like netherlands belgium that type of thing what we call it today uh, people did get into this kind of stuff as you know wealthy merchants would go and rent equipment and go fight but in italy no 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 And fighting we are. Um, the next couple plays show that very well. Um, the fifth scholar of the Polak section, 37 RA, we have the old chestnut. Um, Here. Connor, would you I'm like to... Gonna hook, I'm going to hook up your elbow and mess you up. Mm -hmm. Connor, go. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Barely, barely. Oh, that's so weird. Oh, just get closer to your um, wherever your your mic is. Uh, Aaron, can you scroll up a little bit oh. more? The men, uh, my menu is in the way of reading it. Okay. Oh, uh, how about now? A little. Oh, scroll more. up a little more. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. 
This grapple allows me to strike you in the head with my axe. I'll use my left arm to place you into the low bind, the strong key, which places the opponent in danger of death more than any other. Thank you very much, Connor. All right. So a couple of really interesting things here um, from my perspective. Number one, we see a low key occurring in armor. Okay, if we didn't know that that was still on the table, we get a reminder. Right, the keys are still very much on the table. Number two, that a deadly blow with the axe is possible with one hand in certain circumstances, or at least a sufficiently debilitating one that it's worth not taking. So, um, so that's also very interesting. And then um, lastly, he makes this comment here um, about the strong, the low bind, the strong key which I, I certainly read as being a universal comment. I think he's saying this about the nature of the key, not the key done in armor with the axe. And that is that this strong key places the opponent in danger of death more than any other. And if we read it like that, then we have something, again, we've learned something really interesting about the key that we may have suspected from previous sections, but wasn't told to us explicitly. So cool. I find the uh, the Italian in this very interesting because the uh, the transcript, the Italian transcript is it, it says a strong uh, under key, a strong lower key, and previously he always refers to this as either Schiava Forteza or the third. No, is it uh, not the third minister? He's got well, whatever. He refers back to the play in uh, Dagger uh -huh. with it. And um, it goes on through all of the weapons. The only weapon you don't see a lower key in is lance. And you can do it with the butt of the lance, <laughs> oddly enough, or the point of the lance. Uh, and you don't see the lower key used uh, in the equestrian section, as I recall. Uh, there is a middle key. Yeah, and I don't there's, there, there's a, a neck throw, but I don't believe that there's a, there's a lower key because... Back, this is going to put a lot of a lot of pressure on your shoulder joints regardless of whether you have an advantage you're still going to have a lot of uh, tension in your shoulder joint which could dislocate your own shoulder because you got you know you got a thousand pounds of horse under you adding to the to the uh, energy involved but anyways in the pole axe this particular piece is if you can get someone disoriented enough that you can get them into a strong lower key it doesn't matter what you hit them with. You can hit them in the head. You can hit them in the legs. You can hit them in the nuts. Anything anything you feel like, there's nothing they can do about it. Because once the second hand is off the pole axe, they no longer have a lever. They have a an anchor. <laughs> Yeah. It's the only way to describe it, or uh, you know, like in the in, in the in the period of uh, wooden men and iron, uh, wooden ships and iron men, knocking uh, another ship's mast and and sails into the water was as good as dropping an anchor. So in this particular case, you got the same thing. When you do the lower key here and lock the, your companion up. Their axe is of no use to them whatsoever because they can't make any leverage out of it. And especially if they have a shortened grip uh, behind, which is normal. And you notice that the uh, scholar has shifted to about the middle of the axe to gain leverage. Yeah. This is going to be a major ouchie no matter how much kit you're wearing. Mm hmm and of course, uh, th not only cuts are incumbent here, but also thrusts are possible too. So, very bad, very bad position to uh, to be in. Actually, I don't think I'd bother with a thrust in this position. I'd make big looping strikes like a mace, um, because even if they try to get their arm in the way, you're going to be able to batter them horrifically. Whereas if you stop and wind up a thrust, as you well know from fencing Murph, he might catch it. He might deflect it. Murph's a bugger for picking thrust clean out of the air. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, so there are people that can do it. Whereas if you wind up and hay, you know, haymaker them with the pole axe, even if it's not the most 100% accurate shot, it's going to be ugly because they're already um, in tension 
because of the uh, lower key. When your body's in tension, it doesn't react well to being struck. Mm. You can't flow with uh, with the blow. It's very difficult. Yeah, so either way, very bad position to find yourself in. Oh. Don't, uh, ugly, ugly. don't do it. There, there, are, this... there are no gold stars in this position. Nope. Yeah, Bruce? Uh, this seems to me to almost be a counter to the second play. Um, a counter to the second play. You'd have to step clean over Into his here? axe to make it happen. If he well, doesn't uh, get, get the axe right, if he's, well, if he's putting it in... He he could, you know, one could I, use it as I, a counter to the two things if, you know, if one had the opportunity. Um, but you know, th this is why it's important... While there can be flow in the post or in the plays, it's important to remember that the plays don't have to flow, and you know um, the lower key can come anywhere where it where it works, right? It works where it works. So absolutely, in the second play, if you found an opportunity for it, you might you might do it, right? So I'm, okay. that's a way of agreeing with so you there, Bruce. Just to, yeah, uh, I agree with Bruce as well. It's a good observation. Um, it's just a very low percentage opportunity. If if someone has taken your axe to the ground and you read it, like you read it and went with it, so in a little bit like the Copa de Viana where you read the heavy blow and you sort of slip aside from it, if you do that, let your pole axe go to the ground only momentarily and step in and hook them up in a lower key, that might clear your pole axe. It might or might not. It might give you this position, but it's a low percentage um, opportunity for the simple reason that somebody that's overbound you will tend not to stop. They will tend yeah. to flow from there, and that's just experiential. Yeah. I think that if you can catch somebody who goes, well, what do I do now? I've knocked your axe to the ground. Well, yeah, man, that's great. Then, yeah, sure, why not? If, because you know your are are, eh? There's no reason that you should ever be stuck for an opportunity just because your weapon's out of play. Uh, however, the reality of it is I have never seen it accomplished. I have never accomplished that myself. I have accomplished a lower key from many opportunities, but from just a low crossing, no. I'm more interested in doing worse things to them than getting them in a lower key. And trust me, the pole axe between the legs thing is the worst thing you can possibly imagine compared to a lower key. Lower key is a, a giant annoyance because it, it binds you up. But there are ways out of a lower key. And the way out of the lower key in this particular case is you let go of your axe. And when you let go of your axe, you grab theirs, which is, oddly enough, the next play. It is deep. It is indeed. <clears throat> All right, the next play uh, here in the sequence, Folio 37RB, is this one. Um, Graham, would you like to read the text for us? Sure. Um, I'll use a mezza volta to disarm you of your axe. That done, and while I am still turning, I'll strike you in the head just like the next student will do. I believe you'll fall dead. <laughs> Hilarious. All right. Um, thank you very much, Graham. Okay, so again, um, here is a play which could have followed from the plays that come before, but it's also there for us just to know so that we can do it if we see the opportunity, right? And again, very simply, it is kind of what it says on the tin. Um the scholar is has clearly dropped his axe, seized the axe of the other person, and is going to disarm it and strike him with it. So how this disarm is going to work, it's going to be similar to the disarm of the strato section of the sword in two hands, in that the disarm mechanic uh, here is crossing the enemy's wrists. So all of these disarms here work by having their wrists and crossing in the rotation. So the most the most similar one is this one, Folio 30 VC. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, 
Although, yeah, anyways, so uh, not not to labor the point, this hand is going to come down, this hand is going to come up, and um, you're going to you're going to cross the wrist and do a little volta stabile and refuse and and you'll you'll take it away no problem. A mezzo volta. He says right in the text. A mezzo volta. A mezzo volta. There you go. And so I'll pass a pass back. A nice pass back. Yep. And uh, and then you can do the the play that follows, um, which is to boop them in the snoot, as they say. Uh, uh, any you can you can do that play without without disarming them but you can definitely do it once you've disarmed them because they have no opportunity to cover themselves Good. but uh the, the the boop and the snoot thing is also an opportunity from uh largo it is absolutely yeah well why don't we just move right on to that one so the boop and the snoot uh, 37 sorry, oh, yeah alex go ahead mm. can, you, can you go back to the previous yep, one absolutely i want to follow one kel said how could you do mm -hmm. this play without disarming them if you start out without a weapon Good question. I'm sorry. I might have misunderstood you, but uh, you said that you can do this play without disarming them. But how can you do it if you don't have a weapon? Oh, if you're finding it difficult to keep your weapon because perhaps they can work the box a little better, or you got caught flat-footed while they're working the box on your arms. Remember the box I was talking about a couple yeah, weeks yeah. ago? Yeah. So if they work the box and they shift you off, don't get flummoxed about it. Don't, you know, don't hesitate or go, well, what do I do now? First thing you do is you grab the racks and you rotate it clockwise, period. End of conversation. Like you do um, a Mezzo Volta, rotate it clockwise, and it will turn them because they will be on their forward foot, which is what you're turning against. So their forward foot becomes the pivot point over which you make the turn. Does that make sense? Right, I think I might have just mis, uh, misheard you because I thought you said that you can do this play without disarming them. Oh, you'd be crazy. Okay, yes. <laughs> if, if you can pull this off without disarming them, um, uh, or, or being disarmed, I should say, you're the one that's disarmed. But letting go of your axe purposefully is an opportunity because a lot of people will monkey grip their weapons. Like, will never let go of their weapons because they're terrified of what will happen. And generally, because they don't know how to wrestle. Well, we teach every one of you to wrestle a lot. So you're very comfortable with wrestling. And until you get to the point where you are comfortable with wrestling, you're not ready to move on to the other stuff. I mean, you can play with the other stuff and train it and learn it. But until you're really comfortable with wrestling, the rest of uh, adding weapons and stuff on is not really wise because you have yet to get over the barrier of grappling with whatever is available to you. And this is just a lever. It's just another lever. So in the case that you lose your ax or they've got more control of your arms for whatever reason, you made a mistake, you got too close, you got, you know, you got hooked or whatever, anything that has gone against you can now be remedied by your strength of abrazare. So you step in, disarm them, turn this thing around, it, it throws them off balance, and you give them a swat upside the head. And it's, it's a, a very uh, telling thing. I've done this play, but not struck because of it. Like I just literally, uh, someone got one of my hands off the axle, their axe was standing in front of me because they were trying to thrust me or whatever. And uh, I just let go of my axe, grabbed theirs, and then swatted them in the face, period. Like it was just bang, bang, bang. Didn't hit them very hard. But everybody was laughing and cackling because it's one of those things that you don't expect. People are so accustomed to being a purely weapons fight that when you add Abrazari into it, it's just outside of the experience of the vast majority of people watching even if they consider themselves connoisseurs of the art and you know fury uh, really works on abrazari because it's a critical foundation does that help at all thank you all right so the completion of that play before or as kel said uh, something just from from largo we have here 37 rc uh, <clears throat> And um, uh, Ito, would you like to grace us with your uh, dulcet tones? Dulcet tones. 
Cristo Zoghi el de los Colares. You, you, can, you can just read the English there. You can just read the English there, David. I'm just following orders. Yeah, I'm yeah. Performing second edition. I'm performing the play of the student before me, doing exactly as he said. And yes, I do believe you'll fall dead after you receive my blow to the head. And if you won't be satisfied with this blow, I can very well give you another. Then pull you to the ground by your visor, as we will see next. That's exactly what I'll do to you, as long as my conscience allows it. So, take an attack action, use your bonus action to mm -hmm. on the other hand. Mm -hmm. Just like in version 3 of D&D &D Rules. Uh, that's right, Dave. Um, uh, oh, I'm there's, sorry. There's a whole lot of high, high 20, 20 roll here. <clears throat> yeah, natural 20s, yeah. Um, okay, so there we go. Um, so the uh, the text says, first of all, that this is a follow-on action from what we saw before. So once the axe has been taken away, this axe on the ground here is the this guy's axe. The axe that he's hitting this uh, the enemy with is... Um, the enemies, the axe, the, Zook, the Zookdor's axe, if you will, um, and uh, so it, it, isn't that great? If they, uh, if they don't make their covers, and you're Fendente's land, you'll have a situation similar to this as well, though they may in fact have an axe in hand. But who cares, right? This blow will yeah. sort them out. If it doesn't sort them out, you'll give them another, or you'll do what the play that we see coming next, which is to do this. <laughs> Okay, the, the really critical thing in this plate is not that the you know, your axe or his axe or whatever's on the ground, whoever's axe is on the ground. The critical thing is that the uh, scholar has withdrawn his hands to, towards the tail of the axe. So he's extended the leverage of the blow and the distance that he can throw it at. So as you can see, by the way the feeder plate he's completely outside and created a new center on the Zugadori. Well, you can do the same kind of thing by a uh, mess of Volta backwards. If, if someone's taken a shot at you, like they, they swing a Fendente or a Mezzano at you with a pole ax, uh, you know, even if they tighten their hands up a little bit more towards the tail, if you take a mess of Volta backwards or even just slip your foot as if they were attacking your leg, and then swing whatever a fendente or a mezza uh, with your pole axe at grip towards the foot of the axe. You're in Largo. There's nothing threatening you, and you will smoke them in the head with the leverage of the pole axe. Um, I can tell you this for the simple reason that I've done it like literally a hundred or more times to people. It's just a matter of using your footwork. Um, this is not a bump and grind play. This is a dance play. All right. Anybody have any uh, questions about this one? No. All righty. Great. Moving right along. The eighth scholar, 37 RD in the Getty. Um, Kel, would you like to read this one for us? Certainly. Thank you. I'm, I'm doing to you what the student before me said I would. I'm about to pull you to the ground by your visor. And if I wanted to, I could do the same with our Brazari, which is the better way to do it, and which is something I'm good at. But I'll tell you, grabbing somebody by their visor, especially with a clap visor, oh, man. It's like, it's like, um, it's like grabbing a hook on their head, on their forehead, and dragging them around. It's better than grabbing hair. It's the best way to describe this. It's such an efficient play that you pull someone off their balance long before they can do anything to affect you. They can't do a hip push. They can't grab your knees. There's nothing. So dragging someone like this is instant, you know, sprawl. And then you can do whatever you like. You can walk away, you can clap, you can jump on top of them and stab them with your dagger, you know, whatever you want to do. But the fact of the matter is their balance is gone and they can't pack up and go home. Mm -hmm. And just like plays before, we can not only read this in sequence, which the sequence is suggested in the text, but we can also understand it as merely something to remember that we... It's great to do if we have the opportunity. So 
if you're in a situation where you can grab his visor and throw him down, transition from Frontale to Iron Gate in Abrazare, then uh, do it. Yeah. And great. Oddly enough, if you have a sword in hand, for example, a, uh, you know, sword in armor, and you get to an opportunity where you can grab their visor, the same thing as putting your hand over the visor to blind them. But with a sword, you can't really, you know, uh, blind them and trip them type of thing the same way as you can with a half of a pole axe. But with a sword, if you grab their visor with the left hand, you can twist counterclockwise to your left, and it pops open the visor and pulls them off balance to their right. And you've got now a raised weapon in your right hand because turning down with the left brings the right side of your body up. So you can smite him rightly, as the Germans like to say, um, either with a blow or a thrust in this case. In, in, in my case, if I twist somebody's visor to the side, I'm going to pommel them in the head because I'm not into deadly combat. I'm more into, no, you didn't work. That didn't work for you here. I lay down on the ground for a bit and catch the Tweety Birds. Because, you know, Tweety Birds are good for everybody's humility. There's no two ways about it. I've certainly been humiliated by them long uh, often enough, and I think they're a good learning tool. All right. Any other questions about this one? I know, I know. Who's Tweety Bird? All right. <laughs> Moving right along. Is that a Space Jam character? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. So um, now we come to the. Um, we're starting to get to the some real Fiore, patented Fiore sass uh, here. We have actually now the first master of the axe, or the plays of the axe. Um, these next two plays both have crowns: the exploding, uh, the uh, the caustic powder pole axe play, and the and this one. And they're the only two crowns in uh, in in the section. So isn't that interesting? But nonetheless, here we are. Folio 37 VA in the Getty. We have an axe, which is something of a something of a, a flail, as it were. Something of a well, we'll talk about it. Let's read the text. Um, Mark, would you like to read the text for us, sir? This is an easy play to understand. Look how I can throw the opponent to the ground. And he is on the ground. I think I'll drag him behind me. And when the rope is no longer holds him, he can taste a good number of my strikes. Thank you very much, Mark. All right. So this is a this is a play. <laughs> this is one of the unique plays in, in Fiore where the play that he's doing is facilitated uniquely by the tool that he's using. Uh, as it as it were. Right? So this this axe or this play in the axe section he's not using the axe that we've seen in the rest of the plays he's using a special kind of axe and i actually don't have a good example um a good image example uh for this one kel do you happen to have anything that lying around like has anybody recreated this 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 thing i don't even know i've never i have never seen it in art outside of this image mm -hmm. i have never seen any reference to it it's one of those things where this is as close to Tallhoffer's nonsense as it comes mm. Tallhoffer's got a whole a whole chapter of these unique and bizarre contraptions uh for fanciful combat this particular one though i have every reason to believe that it, it was a used thing not necessarily a commonly used thing but this sort of stuff um, was used to capture people because you have to remember they didn't have a standing police force or a standing army. Uh, they had uh, patrols, you know, like they were assigned particular areas to go and, and, you know, make sure things were under control. And within urban settings, you had various guilds that were required to be a certain amount of armor and a certain amount of equipment and they would stand however many watches 
Um, and the people that were on the watches were typically journeymen. Very, very rarely were the masters were on watches. But the, typically journeymen who would spend, um, say, a couple nights or even a week in command of all the other, uh, you know, lower journeymen and apprentices that were assigned to the watch for your quarter, for your for your uh, guild quarter. So the fur the furriers would have a quarter, and the and the, the leather workers would have a quarter, and blah 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 that kind of thing. So as part of your civic duty, you'd have to go out and train this stuff. Well, there were all kinds of specialized weapons for this. The Japanese had a weapon that was kind of a kind of a yoke with some spikes on it and it was for man trapping you know you could you could catch a, a burglar or you know whatever in this and capture them by the neck without really severely injuring them and yet it was such a pain compliance that they you know go along with it well there's no shortage of horrific things in medieval western europe they're just you know local interpretation the idea of a net for example having some kind of net you could throw at somebody was a perfectly common thing a net with weights or a cloak you'd your own cloak in in later periods of bolognese studies for example cloak is a very common uh, side tool well your cloak isn't just a piece of cloth it's got lead weight sewn in along the hem of the bottom of it not only to help it drape artistically when you're out you know wandering around and make you look excellent but when you swing those things it's got enough inertia that you can carry over a blade or you can carry over an extended arm and create a trap well this kind of thing is not fanciful it's just that nobody else shows it in any of the manuscripts but how many manuscripts have we lost over yeah. the, the the centuries no idea. so it, it, it's hard to say whether this was a thing that was recommended for civic defense that at least one of your guys has got to have a rope to trap or a net to trap you know uh, villains right like people that are a, a general nuisance and there were plenty of them in every every urban context and in a in a rural context nets were used like literally from horseback they'd run over somebody the same way that a cowboy would in a in a 19th century movie with the you know the, the u.s cavalry the horsemen or whatever they'd ride over these guys and cast the net onto them because they wanted to bring them in for justice it wasn't just a matter of killing them out in the dark you wanted to bring them in and see public justice done so capturing them hadn't changed from the Roman concept of capturing uh, criminals. So this is this is not a huge stretch if you look at the traditions of Italy and and especially urban Italy, which was heavily urbanized throughout the Middle Ages, long before people like the English lived to live uh, learned to live inside stone castles. So as to, as to what this yeah. device actually is, based on the artwork, it appears to be some uh, straight uh, uh, shaft with a mount on it of some kind, and then a flexible, probably rope, I suppose, some uh, a flexible thing attached to the mount with a weight attached to the end that would allow you to cast it and wrap, wrap up people. But that's really yeah. all, all we know. Really heavy rope that. or light chain with a weight on the end light of chain. it yeah uh much like uh, much like one of those toys that were very popular where you had a string and a, a turned handle and some kind of little gizmo on top of it like a like a a top or whatever a spinning top and you could spin the top and throw the thing and then give it a quick jerk and it would pop back on it was a game to play right? a dexterity game to play same way that you know yo-yos are today and have been for what 50 years the the number of crazy crazy tricks you could do with yo-yos well think on that with you know people that have time to play with this kind of stuff where they're bored one afternoon and they haven't been assigned to do anything well you're gonna mess around with stuff because just sitting around staring at the sky is just not gonna happen it's not in the psyche of those people uh, that's what poets do, not warriors. 
not a bad thing. It's just different. Any other uh, different mentality? Any questions about this one? Um, yeah, what mm -hmm. situation would this be used in? Because you're saying maybe in like a civil civil uh, disturbance civil kind of thing. Disturbance. Well, it's like it's a one-on-one. Yeah. -on -one. We could definitely speculate, right? Um, you know, maybe there's a civilian context to it. Maybe there's a dual context to it. Maybe there's a military context to it. You know, without knowing more about the tool itself and having some examples of it actually being referred to and used outside of this one play here, you know, it's hard to say. Uh, there's a bit of text before this that says something along the lines of, well, here are some other things that can be done with strange weapons or something like that. But, of course, my lord would never do such things. It's just dishonorable. I actually th I, I think it, that might come just after. Before the... Just after? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that's the, uh, I think that's in the, in the it's text. In, it's after, in this but, section. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, because like, yeah, I was thinking, like, like in a dueling context, you maybe wouldn't want to, you know, there's a pretty, a pretty dishonorable trick, I'd imagine. Well, so, uh, so you know uh, that's 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 a very Anglo, uh, Anglo French chivalric uh, Victorianism, like medievalism, as is termed. Uh, we expect a certain sort of conduct from people, and and you know, uh, because of what we've read in literature over the years and an awful lot of that stuff was literally invented between 1801 and 1900 uh it did never existed it was something that was cast back on them uh, to reflect on the, the nobility of society in victorian society uh medievalisms are, are, are a real you know, a real pot to step in. Uh, they're they're a real bear trap, as it were, because they're so common, and everybody believes them. Like the business about oh, people took a bath once a year, and that's where ba throwing out the baby with the bath water comes in. Absolute crock of nonsense. Um, people bathe regularly. In fact, they had to shut down a lot of bathing houses become they because they became brothels. Public bathing was a very, very common thing throughout the Middle Ages, and in some places that had uh, really effective uh, uh, churches or clerical uh, governance, they might have two bathhouses for men and women, but more often it was the men would go in between such and such a time and the women would go in through, between such and such a time for public bathing. Uh, so hygiene in the Middle Ages is nothing like what we believe it to be. So by the same token, saying is it a dishonorable act? Well, Italians did a lot of things that the French would consider dishonorable because the Italians played lip service to the concept of French chivalry and really emulated it and made made uh, big big uh, big bones about it at tournaments and put on feasts and stuff like that. But they were pretty much play acting. For by and large, the Italian uh, nobility was incredibly pragmatic and incredibly vicious and undeniably violent. If if you want to cast an anachronism, cast Chicago in the 1920s with Al Capone and all those guys back onto the Middle Ages because that's where that stuff came from. The Sicilian mob, the Sicilians did that stuff before chivalry ever made it to uh, Italy. There was a night in the end of the 13th century where the French nobility had taken over control of Sicily. The Sicilians were sick and tired of it. And so in 1298, they all rose up one night, one night, Cosa Nostra. And in one night, they killed all of the important French people of government and held hostage ones that they thought they could get money from. It literally happened in one night and the French had no clue. Now, what do you think that looks like in, you know, twentieth century movies? It's just the suits have changed. That's it. Uh, so uh, so the sort of society they lived in. No nah, man. This is this is not outside the pale. Uh, in the very next play that we're about to go to, there is an interesting line that uh, it's worth bringing up now, which is, um, Fury says, Oh, my lord, the noble, um, my noble lord, the Marquis, I put so many dirty tricks in this book, I know you'll never resort to them. 
but read them anyway, just for the love of knowledge. So one might read this line as saying that this book is not necessarily just for, you know, practical teaching purposes, if ever we decided that it was, but that some of the things in this book may very well be there for the purposes of some kind of love of knowledge, whatever that means, right? That could mean, in an, um, you know, that things are articulated for the point of preservation, for the point of, I don't know, it's not obvious what this means, but the point is, uh, is that an, another another way that we might view some of the more odd parts of this book uh, is that Fiore is writing, is in, choosing to include them, not just per se for their direct practical purposes, but also possibly for something a little more nebulous, like the love of knowledge, um, or n not least to maybe show off to the marquee. So that's something to think about. Uh, Graham. Uh, that is that is a, an interesting perspective. My perspective on that particular thing, having studied a lot about crime and violence in uh, medieval Italy in the period, um, there was an awful lot of stuff that was played at for nobility and for PR purposes. And then there was real life. And when you look at uh, how rebellions were put down, for example. Uh, it's pretty horrific stuff. It's the kind of stuff that we expect from African nations fighting tribal wars. Uh, it's the kind of stuff that we would expect from, the, you know, the Khmer Rouge in, in the 1980s. Uh, and it was very common because you had a very tiny slice of the population holding control over a gigantic population and when that population rebelled uh, because slavery was no longer a thing that population had certain let's say expectations to freedoms that you know the the cultures that came before it that enacted slavery and on a regular basis like a like a societal basis uh, like Greece, for example, people think of Greece as you know the font of democracy, but Greek society was worse than Roman society. It was like one in ten slaves, whereas in Roman society it was one in three or one in four slaves. Uh, a huge difference in Italy. They didn't have slaves so much as they had people that were bound, like bound in their place in society. Um, effectively, they they weren't slaves in that you could just chop their head off type of thing, but they were disenfranchised and this society the nobility of it had all kinds of ways to maintain their place there and also to make war within themselves for you know ladder climbing and and to survive not falling down the ladder as it were um, <laughs> the past is not only a different time but a different world and it's it's hard for us to wrap our heads around the idea that this stinging power of powder stuff would be used in a tournament. It would not be used in a tournament. It would be used in a duel to the death. Someone accused you of rape or murder against another noble person. You had every right under God's judgment to defend yourself to the best of your abilities. No one would castigate you for blinding your opponent because it's God's will. I'm not so you sure about that, but uh, let's, you know? let's, 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 let's veer away from, from that, from, from that perhaps. I'm just, I'm just saying like, if you gotta, you gotta look at it from a perspective of what were they thinking as to what do we think of it? Because you know, what we think of it doesn't really matter because we weren't there. Um, anyway, yeah. So the uh, the last play in the section is is this one, 37 VB, and it is the infamous uh, stinging powder, hollow Polax play. So Amber, you get the honor. Would you like to uh, read this for us, please and thank you. All right. This axe is hollow all around and filled with a powder that is so strong and corrosive that it makes it impossible to open the eyes as soon as it comes in contact with them and may even cause permanent blindness. Yes. I am the act, heavy, cruel, and lethal. 
and I deliver bigger blows than any other handheld weapon. If I miss with my first attack, the axe becomes a useless liability. If I don't miss, my axe can come to the rescue of any other handheld weapon. If I am accompanied by good armor, I can defend with the pulsative guards of the sword. My lord, my noble lord the Marquis, I've put so many dirty tricks in this book, I know you'll never resort to them, but examine them anyway, just for the love of knowledge. This recipe for the powder that goes into the axe I showed in the previous picture. Take the milk of the thyme and dry it in the sunlight or in the oven and make a powder out of it. Take two ounces of this powder and one ounce of powder of Fior de Preta and mix them together. Then put the mixture in the ax. This can also be done with any fine caustic powder as you can find some fine ones indeed in this book. Thank you very much, Amber. All right, so this is a great Pure, uh, piece of text here. Lots of really juicy bits, um, bits for us. Um, I've seen it done with talcum powder. It's hilarious. Yeah. So let's um let's address the play first, and then we'll get into some of the interesting things in the text. So the play is kind of what it again what it says on the tin. They've come to an engagement here of the axes. So two axes have come and crossed at the the first third, maybe the middle, I guess, and you see the um the player's axe with the caustic powder the head is pointed at the face of the um of the of the enemy and uh the caustic powder on contact has sprung from this hollow hafted poleaxe and into the face of the um of the opponent and is therefore going to uh gain time <laughs> for this scholar to uh for this person to land a telling blow um possibly causing permanent blindness, being corrosive, whatever, that would uh, that would suck and inhibit your uh, the rest of your play. Um, so to go through this text here. So f first of all, we, s we saw that both of these figures, this guy and the guy before, have crowns. They're also on their own page, right? Uh, or they're on the verso of their own page, I suppose that is uh, that is true. Um, uh, on the verso of the page, uh, this one. So, anyways, it doesn't matter. So, um, the text of this play, some of the, some of the text seems as if it's something of an introduction to the axe, doesn't it? So he talks about the the, the corrosive powder, okay, and then he goes, "I am the axe, heavy, cruel, and lethal, mortal, ponderous, and cruel, and I deliver bigger blows than any hand, handheld weapon, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. He starts to make general comments about the axe. If this is the if this is a crowned master and he's making general comments about the axe, why isn't this first in this in the section of plays, right? In the selection of plays. Very interesting that it's actually last. Um, but nonetheless, he says some very interesting things. Um, some things that we have clearly seen through our study of the rest of the plays. The axe is um, heavy, uh, cruel, and lethal. Yes, yes. If I missed with my first attack, the axe becomes a useless liability. Um, the the axe can the weight of the axe can hinder successive blows at Largo if you're not careful, right? So I, I don't know if this is a little rhetorical to me. I'm not sure it's it's quite that bad, but you don't want to miss with your blows and with the axe, right? It doesn't flow like the sword does. Um, if I'm accompanied by good weapons, I can defend with the um, by with the pulsativa guards of the sword. Okay, that's great. We already kind of know that. Right, that was already we already suspected that. So the guards of the sword um, are good for us in Largo as well. That's great. And then again, this last line here. I put so many dirty tricks in this book. I know you'll never resort to them. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. But read them anyway, just for the love of knowledge. It's not obvious what this means, but it could it could mean something interesting um, with respect to why Fury is making this book. What's his what's his motive? And then lastly, of course, we have this paragraph, which is this one. Um, this is the powder recipe. Um, two of things to note here from my mind. First, it's the uh, the Fior di Preta is the actual term in the Italian. Um, Fior di Preta. And it's not, we don't really know what this is yet. There are some good theories. The last I looked, some people have some, have a strong suspicion they know what actual flower this is. 
Um, but it's not. Um, some, somebody found this thing in a 15th century yeah. uh, herbal, and it's and it it's all detailed in there. Yeah, but you know, it's this, it's this some like, flower. Like mm-hmm. ten years ago, is it very vague? Yeah. No, what they're talking about is is the uh, not the flower, the fiora, the but the the ground. Yeah. Uh, pestles. Yeah. Of, a particular plant. Mm-hmm. No, 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 somebody, somebody that's really into herbals and all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. went, okay, I've seen that before because yeah. it's a stinging powder you throw at people with a bag. They mm-hmm. put it in a little bag and throw it at people and the bag burst open or, or the bottle burst open or whatever, little clay pot type of thing. Yeah. And it's it's a fairly well-known uh, sort of thing in the herbalist community. But you know what? These days finding that stuff is not going to be easy online. It was somebody that was a specialist in, um, what do you call it, the Wiccan herbology type of thing, and, and they just went, there it is, 15th century. Uh, in the 14th century, you will not find this in text anywhere. You'll find the plants listed, but not how to use them. Whereas in the 15th century, they get into details about how to use them as with many other things in the 15th century. There's a thing about how to make leather shields uh, that's never seen before. And yet, why are they making leather shields in the 15th century when they have such amazing armor and weapons and stuff, you know, and so on. But fact of the matter is, it was considered important to know it. So somebody was doing it. That's right. And, uh, and the, the last point I'd make here, this might be more for um, more history buffs and manuscript people, but um, there's a couple things we've seen so far in the book that have um, g- given us questions as to its um, the as to the the circumstances of the Gettys collation. And one one notable uh, problem uh, with the Getty was that there there were some pages out of order, right? Pages of the Fifth Remedy Master. Um, Though uh, the pages that are out of order are um, could just as easily have been put in order, they weren't. They weren't written out of order. They were merely um, collated out of order. So um, that's not too bad. But here we see a comment in the text. Right, this can be done with any fine pa- caustic powder, as you can find some fine ones indeed in this book. This is the only recipe in this book. So. Yeah. It's po- so you know, just to underscore the 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 possibility that the Getty is not an original version, as it were, that um, it's a that it's a copy yeah. or that it's a it's a continuation of perhaps a previous version or book or project of Fiore. This this idea right is still with us, and this may be a little interesting tidbit to um, tickle uh, our, our our memories. Okay, you know what? Or our, our interest. Say that I, I, I'm not going to speak for Ariella because we don't like each other at this point, but um, Ariella would tell you, no, you need to know and, more about how books were put together. Well, please go ahead. Why and is that? Quite frankly, books were constantly rebound throughout the 17th and 19th century. So uh, chunks, for example, the Morgan. The Morgan's a giant mess because the the leaves the the folios were rebound into another binder so there may be whole chunks of it that were just tossed because they were either damaged or whoever put them together said well we don't have enough room in this one this is old stuff who cares you know um or in in uh, sometime in the 17th century when this thing was rebound whoever owned them went well look um I've got three of these things, and I want them in one book. Make it work. So making it work was to get rid of the weird stuff, like the things that were outside of what the rest of the material was. We don't know because that's right. those we don't decisions know. were made mm-hmm. in a time and a place that we have no idea what the priorities were about. Um, this particular case, if we go back to the, the long and gigantic discussions about the the genesis of the first three uh, manuscripts that we we have known about, because the Florius is a very late uh, discovery and would have been hidden from us if that little creep had had his way. But uh, sorry, sorry. This is uh, recorded, Um, uh, Kel. Yeah, like I said, no names. But uh, anyway, uh, the, the point being 
that our understandings of folio construction have to accept the fact that later um, librarians or managers, I don't know how you would describe it, uh, would take apart old books that were falling apart uh, simply because of the you know, ravages of time and rebind the folios because the folios are on parchment and they're very durable, but the bindings are simply and thread and cord. Very little glue was used. It's not the same sort of book binding techniques we use today. So they could take folios from books that they had uh, purchased in a library or had been you know, given access to or whatever, and they would rebind them because the thing was falling apart. The outer layers were rotted or you know, water damaged or, or whatever the case may be. And they'd take the parts that they wanted to keep out of it that they thought were really interesting when when whoever bought the book, um, they wanted those pieces and didn't care about the others. And, and an incredibly cavalier sort of attitude towards uh, maintaining texts and maintaining manuscripts. But in, in that period, it was, it was no more, I'm going to say no more relevant than our collections of comic books today. We will take a comic book that is very rare and boring and dull and perhaps not the most interesting thing, but, but simply because it's very rare and maybe the first of its kind, and we will treat it with reverence. Whereas five or six issues later, where there's lots of copies that have survived, even some of them in the kind of scrubby condition, will be rebound to make a binder that says, okay, we've got issues one through ten here. You follow? Like so, it's, uh, so it's, Cal, it's what, I, of, what I'm what I'm saying is that, sort of concept. What I'm saying is is precisely that because we don't know, it's an interesting thought to consider not only um, that there could be other parts of this particular manuscript that may not be in the version we have now. That's all. That's possible. But also yes. that. But also that the that the manuscript, even if it's whole that we have, this manuscript, the Getty, that's come to us may be a version or a compilation or some of some such thing from a previous project where Fiori perhaps has expounded on other topics uh, or included other things, including perhaps more recipes well, uh, of different caustic powders and other things, right? And it's just this little line that he's, that he's thrown in here, but it's, it's, uh, it could be a little interesting hint to us. I'm just putting it out there okay. for everybody. No, I, I appreciate That's your all. comment there. I think that... Uh... But that's it. I just wanted to draw to draw attention to it, and it's thrown in at the end, at the end of this little chapter. Um, does anybody have any? Uh, Kel, did you, did you cut out? Things were dealt with. Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry, yeah. Kel, you cut out there. Yeah, I'm just saying no, no. Um, manuscript production was a different sort of thing, whether they survived in the original versions or not. But the fact of the matter that the Getty has so much gold and so much red and blue especially in it uh, means it was a presentation copy that has a huge amount of money behind it compared to the Morgan, which has a little bit of silver in it but no blueberry red or whatever um no no the, the getty is a presentation copy it may not have been the exact copy that was presented to the marquis de ferrara but it it is definitely a presentation extremely expensive copy although pieces may have been dropped off of it in later periods once it was rebound um no this isn't a backup copy if that's what you're inferring it wasn't um does anybody okay. have any uh, further questions or comments about uh, this uh, this play or since we're at kind of the end of our time here about the axe section uh, section in general Aaron Beatty had a number of questions that we only addressed up to half of last week. I'm going to post those questions and my answers to them onto the this particular Discord discussion. Not right. at, not in not in the uh, mm -hmm. not on the Emma Scholar thing because or the Emma Facebook page because it's just clutter there. So 
um, in time if you have more questions or things that you know you want to look at there may be some answers there thanks Kel. that's great yeah you can throw that right into the discord channel uh, uh, here um, yeah all right um, so um, with with that um, that leaves us at the end of the plays of the axe uh, awesome. which is uh, crazy um, we're, we're really getting there uh getting I think to terri- the i think yeah. it's terrific and i really yeah. like that so many people have taken an interest in these sections even though you're you're not playing with them in your studies you know while we were active and you know with uh you know providence willing emma toronto will be active again in the near future um you know, there's certainly people working really hard to make sure that Emma Toronto is going to have a home base in the near future. So, you know, keep your hopes up, folks. It's all good. And uh, these folks are going to be there for you. I unfortunately will not be, but, you know, I'm always there to talk to. Hey, you might have your own people as it as it happens. And uh, it could happen. We'll see. Um, all right. Um, so, uh, yeah, so next week we're going to meet and begin the spear section, and then that will be relatively brief. Um, the spear section isn't that, that long play-wise per se, though I'm sure we'll have a lot to talk about. And then we'll drift into the beginning of the mounted section. Won't that be cool? The mounted section is huge fun. Mm-hmm. Huge fun. All right, everyone. Then uh, with that, I will Thank bid you, you adieu. And I hope you guys have a wonderful evening and we'll see yep. you next. Uh, oh, uh, we, oh, actually, wait, before you go, before you go, there may be something ha- next Monday um, to do with a, uh, the year memorial for uh, the passing of Ross Goodfellow. So, so we, uh, we may in fact cancel um, this session for next Monday and instead invite people to, um, be at the memorial, but further details will be posted about that by David Ito, who is here uh, in the main MF page. David, do you have, do you want to say anything else about that at this at this point? Well, certainly, I've 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 been talking with Veronica, and we've been mm-hmm. in contact with Robin to just set up a little memorial. I'll be I'll be sending out a Zoom, and uh, I have a paid Zoom account, so I should be able awesome. To do it. So awesome. we'll have a you know we'll wherever we are, we will. Uh, you know, take up our swords and do our opening. Share a, share um, a memory of the last yeah. year that we yeah. think Ross would be interested in hearing about. Have a drink and uh, close like we would in the um, Yeah, Dave, uh, send me a PM and keep me up to date on what's going on with your uh, career developments because I haven't heard anything since. Yes, okay? understood. Thanks. All right. All well, right. And with that, everybody have, have a good evening. Take care. We'll Thank see you, you next all Monday. Thank you for joining us. Thank Hi, everyone. You. Good night. Thanks, Aaron and Cal. You're welcome. Thanks, Cal. Great as always. Thanks, guys.